Thank you very much, Paul. It's a delight to be here. Well, why don't we start straight off, you and, um, and when did you first get the idea? Can you remember when you got the first idea for this book? I mean, what uh, inspired you to yeah. embark on it? Yes, well, like a lot of us here in, in Stratford, I was um, much occupied with the series of Shakespeare anniversaries yeah. that we've all had recently and all enjoyed for the most part. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, 2012, which was the World Shakespeare Festival, and then 2013, yeah. which was the anniversary of Shakespeare's birth. In 2016, which we just enjoyed, which was the anniversary of Shakespeare's death, of course. And I, um, I think I started to feel that we, or at least I, had to have a kind of credible and communicable answer mm. to the question why Shakespeare matters, rather than just keep saying it, keep assuming it, keep invoking it as a sort of self-evident, yes. however enjoyable truth. So that was part of it. And then I I do remember being at the theatre, which is obviously one of the privileges of, of living in, nearby and working in Stratford, and um, thinking, you know, it, it, it actually, in many ways, it, 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 is, it is the characters. That they're, 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 they're so alive, they're so movingly alive. And Falstaff says, give me life, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. And um, I think Shakespeare did give him life, and he gave life to many other characters as well. And, and I felt that, you know, there, there's a politics of that. There's a mm -hmm. politics of, of, of giving life to... To, to everybody, to, mm -hmm. to, to character in general, to, yeah. um, and that was one one germ I think of the book. Seeing mm -hmm. see, seeing a to me sort of surprising, although actually very simple link between the vitality of Shakespeare's characters and freedom mm -hmm. as such. Yeah. That, that was this the sniff. I, I do you feel it's a is it a new departure in your work, or do you think yeah. it's in some sense at least a mm -hmm. continued engagement with things that mm -hmm. you've been writing about in your previous? On yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I, I've always been sort of, you know, a bit wearingly intense and earnest. <laughs> no. And my, um, my previous books, as you well know, I, I, I've written about shame and I've written about the demonic, so yeah. big, big, big topics, but I suppose they, they were more negative, a bit more angsty, at least at first sight. But on the other hand, I, I've always had an interest in transformation. Uh, for me, shame in Shakespeare turned out to be a kind of way to engage with the world outside the self. So mm -hmm. shame is a, an experience of, of sort of self dissolution, which might be an opportunity to see what's what's beyond the self. And then in in the demonic, I, I was interested in the fact that great demonic heroes in Shakespeare and elsewhere in literature make a kind of absolute stand against things as they are. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in this book, I. I wanted to sort of own and, and indeed commit to a sort of positive um, affirmation mm -hmm. of freedom, of, of emancipation. Mm -hmm. And I suppose I'm aware that that not repairs a link, but sort of mm -hmm. confesses a link between, between my work and the literary criticism that came out of, particularly out of the 1980s, and your work very much included, which, which, which you know, which was work written with, with, a, with a belief that literary criticism could actually make a positive, creative contribution to political culture more broadly. And I, I, I'm not the only person who thinks that mm -hmm. some of that heat has gone out mm -hmm. of, of, of recent Shakespeare Indeed, criticism. Yes. And I wanted to pull it back. Mm -hmm. I suppose just the final thing there is that perhaps freedom is something that's been a bit off limits for a while, even in that tradition. And I started to feel, as I, I looked into it, that freedom, the passion for freedom has been a great driver of Western modernity. I wanted mm -hmm. to reconnect that mm -hmm. with the tradition. Well, that leads in quite nicely to the next question. I mean, it's a really wide-ranging book, yeah. um, <clears throat> and it tackles the uh, incredibly complex, uh, elusive even, uh, yeah. subject of freedom from a whole range of angles. But one of its most important political aims yeah. is, I quote you, to recover the lost tradition of Shakespearean freedom, uh, a tradition which you trace from Garrick's 1769 Stratford Jubilee <coughs> um, through the Chartist movement, a chap called Cooper in particular, is that right? Yeah. 
Um, and uh, on to the, also the 19th century, of course, the 1848 revolution, the extraordinary story that you tell of the Hungarian revolution of yeah. Kossuth. Yeah. That's a marvelous yeah. part of the book. Yeah. And then you, and you bring it right down, the tradition, you bring it right on down, don't you, to yeah. Nelson Mandela and his fellow prisoners yeah. on Robben Island, all signing their precious yeah. copy of the complete works, you yes. know, known yes. as the Robben Island oh, Bible. Oh, yes, yeah. exactly. So, I mean, could you say something more about that aspect of your work? Yes. Covering the, the lost tradition of Shakespeare. Yeah. Freedom. And perhaps, as we're sitting in the yeah. birthplace trust, yeah. it might be prudent to start with <laughs> giving us an idea of mm. of the uh, the role played by Garrick's... Yes, yeah, yes. No, ...jubilee yeah. in, the, in forging that tradition of Shakespeare. Yeah, I'd be delighted to. I mean, again, I mean, partly because of the big anniversaries, I was talking to Paul and my <coughs> And Miguel and other colleagues uh, 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 and people across the town, Geraldine, the RSC, about what we might do now mm -hmm. for Shakespeare anniversaries in our time. It was natural, of course, to return to the first big Shakespeare Indeed, celebration, yeah. which was the Jubilee of 1769, which was here in this town. This town is a sort of living museum of it. Um, and we did that, we did it as a group, and the more, the more I looked at it, the more surprising it was to me. I, I Michael Dawson, my colleague, from the classic account of it and I've really benefited from that and um, looked at the, the the historical record a bit and it, Garrick, because it's the first big Shakespeare celebration, it's not some wearingly familiar thing, it's 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 a real happening, it's mm. an energetic thing. I don't think even Garrick knew what it was. Um, and Garrick was the first ever free man in Stratford. I mean, that's how they sort of brought, got him here. And it, it was a very appropriate thing for him to be because of his revolutionary new style of acting. He was more expressive than any actor had ever been before. He didn't just throw postures. I mean, he quite did that. But he, he, he was more naturalistic, more, more alive. So he's the first free man in Stratford. And he wore a rainbow ribbon in Stratford and encouraged all the festival goers to wear such a thing, and you indeed have it, Paul, in the archive downstairs, a beautiful thing. And the Rainbow Ribbon was meant to represent not just the manifold um, shapes of Shakespeare's genius, but also to represent the fact that Shakespeare really was, in Garrick's and uh, Jubilee's estimation, for all creeds and parties. Mm. So it's a kind of rainbow coalition mm. I have on the lecture. Um, and James Boswell came to Stratford dressed up as a as a course of consumption in solidarity with the International Liber Liberation Music Movement. Sorry, so it wasn't your standard, polite mm. sort of Sunday fate kind of literary festival. Not that there's anything wrong with Sunday fate. But I mean, perhaps the real the real indication that Garrick was about freedom, I think, was the fact that this was the first big Shakespeare festival. He didn't put on any Shakespeare at all. There was no Shakespeare play, there were no Shakespeare poems recited. Garrick wrote his own poem, inspired by Shakespeare, and recited it. That was the great centrepiece of the Jubilee. Um, but uh, there, was a, there was a horse race, there was a, a Shakespeare cup, there, were, there was a planned procession, there were planned fireworks, um, there was an oratorio. And I think this is surprising to us, but I think then it's an, it's an indication that Shakespeare was to Garrick, above all, when he took it to the streets of Stratford, a stimulus to us to make life freshly, to be free ourselves, a kind of Garrick represented or, or gave voice mm -hmm. to or enacted a kind of mm -hmm. call to freedom here in Stratford at the first mm -hmm. ever big Shakespeare celebration. Because it really, it sat in that it wasn't expressly identified with political liberation, a political liberation movement like yes. the Chartist or yeah, possibly later in history. Nevertheless, it's symbolically, implicitly, it, yes, absolutely. It was aligned with it was the same spirit, moved by the same spirit. It was, and in fact, it did it did spill over into actual political activism mm -hmm. um, because John Wilkes, who was the great political mm -hmm. figurehead of the day, who was campaigning for an increased franchise. He himself expressly aligned himself with Garrick. He was slung into prison um, for writing a seditious libel, really, against the, the king in a, in, in a, in a newspaper. Um, and his birthday was celebrated in, in prison, and they adapted the same song that they sang for Shakespeare in 1769 to that jubilee for Wilkes's 45th birthday in prison. And it, you know, if you look at the published text, it, it reads, Mr. Garrick may... Um, brag of his Warwickshire wag, and then goes on to say that instead of saying, Oh, the wag of the lad of all lads is a Warwickshire lad, which is a great slogan of the Shakespeare Jubilee, it says that a Middlesex friend is a, 
Mm. A friend of all friends is a Middlesex friend because Wilkes had stood for election in Middlesex and every time he'd been returned, the government had thrown him out. So mm. there is a clear link between the great political cause yeah. of that day. It's really quite remarkable, isn't it, when, when you recover it and put and stitch all those stories together. It was. How yeah. powerful and enduring the idea of Shakespeare, as, as he's called, by the charge of the people's poet. Uh, yes. It, no, I mean, I think a lot of people, I think, were quite surprising. It's a degree to which radical movements identified with him. You did yourself. I myself found it absolutely surprising. I mean, I, 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 I sort of felt the political Shakespeare began in 1985 mm. when that title was, was published. It's a distinguished book. But to find that these were people who are not paid to, mm. to, to do uh, what we do, but who themselves mm. took the trouble, really, to... I mean, obviously, there was great, great presumably political and cultural capital in aligning their fortunes mm. with Shakespeare. But they, you know, they went further mm. than that. Cooper, who you mentioned, mm. who was head of something called the Shakespearean um, Association of Leicester Chartists and was known as the Shakespearean in general and wanted to send chartist peti petitions on Shakespeare's birthday. His commitment to Shakespeare was no idle commitment. He knew Hamlet off by mm. heart. And when they had to stage a benefit to, to, to pay his legal costs, because he was threatened with prison mm. and he did land up in prison, Cooper played Hamlet because he knew the part anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so, I don't know. <laughs> no. It's remarkable, isn't it, that uh, there's so many stories like that. Yeah. And, uh, um, the Dreyfus case I was reading yes. about in Robert Harris's novel yeah. not long ago. And um, uh, again, uh, Dreyfus, um, did, one of the main things he did all the time he was incarcerated there in Devil's Island was, was read and reread the tragedies, annotating them over and over again. But it's, it's remarkable that so, such different. Uh, Figures yes. in different moments of history, in different cultures, yeah. different kinds of movement, yeah. all felt that Shakespeare's Shakespeare himself or yes. Shakespeare's drama, yes. characters within the drama, perhaps yeah. different. We should come back yeah, to that subject in a moment, don't we? Yeah. Um, it felt they instinctively felt that he was his vision was somehow on their side. I think all of no? no, I think I, I think that is right. I mean, I <clears throat> I think there's a kind of you know, posthumous contribution Shakespeare makes to one of his own characters called Posthumous, isn't mm -hmm. it? Shakespeare makes to liberal modernity. Mm -hmm. And at that time, uh, a lot of those activists, mm -hmm. uh, as well as thinkers and actors and so forth, I, I think felt that the tide of the world was, yeah. was moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. There's something about Shakespearean drama that exemplifies um, democracy, political mm -hmm. progress. Um, and it's, it's a resource, it's a great mm -hmm. living resource, and it's a resource for the fight.